Good afternoon. Welcome today to today's Candidates Forum, BC's Climate, Economy and the 2020 Election. I'm Karen Tam Wu, the co-chair of Catalyst Business Alliance and the BC Director for the Pemina Institute. To start, I'd like to acknowledge that we are hosting today's event from the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. We are grateful for their stewardship of these lands and waters since time immemorial. Today's forum is presented by the Catalyst Business Alliance and the Pemina Institute. The Catalyst Business Alliance is a network of Canadian companies working together to champion strong climate and energy policy and the creation of a resilient economy. The Pemina Institute is Canada's leading climate and energy policy think tank. We work together with governments, industry and communities to advance a prosperous, clean energy future for Canada. I'd like to thank our partners, the Real Estate Foundation of BC, Sitka Foundation and North Family Foundation. If you'd like to support our work in this important area, please get in touch with us at pembina.org. I'd like to introduce the candidates for today. George Heyman, BC NDP candidate for Vancouver Fairview. Peter Millibar, BC Liberal candidate for Kamloops North Thompson. Adam Olson, BC Green candidate for Saanich North and the Islands. Thanks to the three of you for joining us today. Today's panelists are leaders in the Canadian Catalyst Business Alliance. Julia Banovitz, Director, Government Relations with Energex Renewable Energy and Co-Chair of Catalyst Business Alliance. Patrick Nangle, CEO of Moto Cooperative. Anna Stukas, VP of Business Development at Carbon Engineering. And Chris Hazel, Environmental Impact Lead at Arcteryx. For today's format, each candidate will have three minutes to give an opening statement. Our four panelists will each ask one question and will also pose questions submitted by forum attendees. You can submit a question in the chat box at any time during the event. Each candidate will have 90 seconds to answer each question. I'll give a 30 second signal, a 10 second signal and ring a bell to signal times up. We'll vary the order in which each candidate answers. And importantly, don't make our producer, Stephen Hoy, use the mute button. We'll go through as many questions as we can today. And at the end, we'll finish up with each candidate having 30 seconds for closing statements. So we'll start with opening statements in the order of Peter, George, and Adam. Over to you. Great, thank you, uh, Karen, and welcome everyone uh, here on this uh, webinar. It's uh, it's great to be able to participate in things like this and, and get the message out uh, to the broader uh, community. Uh, I don't think anyone was expecting an election uh, this early on, but uh, here we are, and it's important, I think, that we do uh, uh, make sure that the public understands just exactly where the various parties are. Certainly, uh, the BC Liberal Party, we do recognize um, the importance of making sure that we are innovating, moving forward, uh, that we are embracing uh, that green economy as we transition out from a fossil fuel economy. I think everyone agrees uh, over the next uh, several years uh, that transition is going to continue to happen. We've seen it already starting to happen in the way uh, electric vehicles are being embraced, uh, especially in the more densified urban areas, uh, when we're seeing technologies around uh, mass transportation and those types of, of uh, uh, technologies that are moving people around with less of a carbon footprint. Uh, there is no doubt that uh, we do need to continue to address and bring forward uh, creative and innovative ideas. And that's why I guess it's, it's a little disappointing uh, to hear uh, the government, uh, when they triggered this election, uh, frankly use uh, one piece of legislation that was flawed um, as an excuse for triggering this election, and that would be Bill 17. Uh, Bill 17 that uh, would have actually uh, created an environment where Indigenous nations and others uh, would not be able to uh, uh, reasonably still be able to get their, their energy projects onto the grid with BC Hydro. It would have removed the self-sufficiency clause uh, within British Columbia that we would not have to rely on our own energy production. Uh, and in fact, it would increase uh, brown energy imports from the United States. Now I know uh, the NDP will say that's not the case. It was about a clean energy bill. Uh, the reality is it wasn't. Uh, it would not define what clean energy is. Uh, it was going to leave that to regulation after the fact. Uh, which is surprising because I think everyone on this call could very easily rattle off four or five types of technology that would be considered green and clean uh, and those were not included in the bill. It was left for interpretation and we also know uh, that with the grid system down in the United States 
it's very tough to track where the power is generated once it's onto the grid and how it's going to be. So that certification process was dubious at best. On top of that, in spite of all of the talk about undrip from the government, uh, we have seen that uh, First Nations were not properly consulted with Bill 17 either. So the fact that that bill was removed from legislation, calendar, and then an election triggered by it a year early um, is very concerning uh, to us and the BC Liberals. Uh, we want to see that uh, all types of innovation on a green economy moving forward get embraced and not those types of, of policies and legislation moving forward. So uh, I'll wrap up my first three minutes with that and I look forward to the questions and uh, the discussion as we move through today. Thanks, Peter. Over to you, George. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, I am uh, joining you from the uh, traditional territory of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh peoples. Uh, I want to start by saying that, um, that British Columbia made a good start on being a leader in climate action when Gordon Campbell introduced a, a carbon tax. But I think we were all very frustrated in the years between 2011 and 2017 when uh, BC slid backwards, when no progress or commitment was made to either increasing the, the carbon tax or taking meaningful climate action. Uh, and in fact, uh, when the previous government under Christy Clark established a climate leadership team, uh, largely uh, she ignored their most important recommendations and left uh, British Columbia in a place of falling backwards. So one of the first things we did when we uh, formed government with the support of the Green Party under the Confidence and Supply Agreement was to set new targets in 2017, targets for 2030, 40, and 50. We also legislated the carbon tax and showed how it would increase over time, sending a clear price signal. In 2018, we introduced a plan to meet those targets called Clean BC. We did it in collaboration with the Green Caucus, with Andrew Weaver, using the members of the Climate Solutions and Clean Growth Advisory Panel that we established and we independently modeled reductions in transportation, in buildings and in industry that covered 75% of our targets to uh, our targets to 2030. And we are committed to showing modeling for the remainder of it by the end of the year. Then uh, last year, we introduced accountability legislation that would show where we plan to go uh, three years going forward uh, and what we were gonna spend on meeting those targets. And then looking backward two years to see how we had done. And included in that is an independent commentary and advice of the new Climate Solutions Council. In addition, we agreed to set interim and sectoral targets, and we had good input on that from uh, outside um, commentators and from the Green Caucus. In our recent economic recovery plans, we consulted with environmental organizations, with the Catalyst Business Coalition, uh, with the Climate Solutions Council, and we made significant investments in transportation, uh, moving to heavy duty trucking, setting up an innovation challenge, establishing a center for innovation and clean growth, supporting active transportation, and we have a commitment to build on those in budget 21-22 and moving forward. Our platform includes a commitment to be net zero by 2050. Climate is one of the four pillars of our platform and it's woven throughout. It is important that we meet the goals that we set in legislation. It's important that we work with everyone in British Columbia who wants to contribute to those goals. Thank you very much. I look forward to questions. Thank you, George. Adam. Thank you for this opportunity to debate this timely and critical issue. Surely we can agree that there is a need to drastically and immediately decarbonize unless we be at severe risk of extensive flooding massive fires, extreme heat, extreme storm events, long-term droughts, ecosystem collapse, and species extinction due to climate change. The situation in front of us is an urgent crisis, both a critical threat and opportunity for BC's economy. The choices we make now dramatically impact our quality of life today and in the future. Investments now will save us from potential crushing economic ruin in the decades to come. We need concrete and evidence-based action, not empty promises. The BC NDP and Liberals have proven that they cannot be trusted on the climate economic file. With the evidence in front of us of the, of the cost of worsening climate change and our potential to build a sustainable economy, 
Last year, the NDP and Liberals teamed up to approve and heavily subsidize the biggest point of source of emissions in BC history. The BC Greens carried hours of debate on our own and voted against the project 14 times. Every NDP and Liberal MLA lined up behind their leaders to approve that generational sellout. This is what makes the NDP's promises to get to net zero emissions by 2050 meaningless. LNG Canada alone would exceed our 2050 emissions by one limit by 160%. And they won't publicly rule out wood fiber and Kitimat LNG. With these projects, BC would exceed our 2050 target by over 200%, even if everyone else went to zero by 2031. Now they're saying trust us alone to deal with climate change. In my experience, that would be a terrible idea. The BC Greens, frankly, had to drag the NDP kicking and screaming to do this work because they didn't like it to get in the way of their desire to log, frack, and dredge. We deliberately framed Clean BC as more than an environmental plan. It was to be the economic plan for an exciting emerging economy of the future for British Columbia, leveraging our competitive advantages, geography, educated workforce, access to bountiful natural resources and assets, we could, through our actions, begin in earnest the transition to tomorrow's economy today. If the NDP have their way going forward, Clean BC will be little more than a communications exercise. On the climate-friendly Clean BC plan, the NDP went 75% of the way. On fossil fuels, they went 160 to over 200% all in. There are many thoughtful and clearly articulated policies that we need to roll out for economic, social, and environmental sustainability and resilience. The Pembina has some just on their website. The words, but what is missing here is an honest conversation and an honest debate. The BC Greens have embraced all three and we're ready to get to work with our colleagues when they show up to the table in a good way. Thank you, Adam. All right, we'll turn it over to our panels to, to ask questions. And first is Julia Balabanovitz from Interjex Renewable Energy. Hi, good afternoon. I'm pleased to be here today. So recognizing that climate action leadership creates an unprecedented opportunity for many businesses to thrive and new sectors to emerge, all while building a more durable economy, my question for you is what businesses and sectors do you see offering the greatest economic opportunity and highest impact climate solution? And how will your party support them? So you'll each have 30 seconds to respond and we'll, the order for this will be Adam, Peter, George. Over to you, Adam. Thank you very much for the question, Julia. And I think what's most important is that we have a, an, an honest conversation about uh, moving away from the massive subsidies uh, in the 1950s technologies. We've been putting huge amounts of taxpayer money into those, into subsidizing and propping up those industries. One of the uh, really, well, a couple of the really important initiatives that the BC Greens brought to the table in the last, in the last uh, 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 parliament was the Innovation Commissioner and the Emerging Economy Task Force. Those, uh, that was the work that lay, was to lay the groundwork and the foundation moving forward. And those recommendations are, are uh, the basis for which the government needs to build out moving on, moving forward. Unfortunately, when the innovation commissioner, uh, the first innovation commissioner uh, moved on, uh, we again had to pull at the government, uh, the BC NDP, to appoint the next innovation commissioner. It wasn't even certain that they were going to do that. And so I think we need to, like in a transition, we have to start the transition and we have to do it in a meaningful way. And that means we have to stop subsidizing fossil fuels. We can't pick winners and losers. There are incredible technologies and incredible solutions in front of us. And, and it's not recreating the wheel here. The, the, the solutions are in front of us. The innovators are in our province. And if the government spent half as much investing in those businesses in our province as they do investing in fossil fuels, we'd be a heck of a lot further down the road than we are right now. Thank you, Adam. Peter. Thank you. And just to clarify, is it 30 seconds or 90 seconds? 90 seconds, sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, so, 
you know, I think with innovation, I think we have to look uh, across the spectrum of all sorts of, of ways we have economic uh, development in British Columbia. So as someone who lives in the interior of British Columbia, uh, I think it's safe to say that we all re should be recognizing that the resource industries are still an important part of the overall economy of British Columbia. That said, there's a ton of innovation that can be happening uh, within mining, within forestry, within other resource extraction industries. Uh, that brings them in line with uh, GHG emissions, make sure that their standards are even to a higher level than the world leading standards most operate under to begin with right now. And when we dovetail that with the new technologies for the urban setting in terms of, of how we can advance um, those types of technologies, that's critical. So when I look at the electrification of British Columbia and I look at making sure that we are tapping in uh, to trying to make sure that we are a true green source of energy, that's a big kind of competitive advantage as we move forward in a, in a world economy where suppliers and vendors are going to be looking for that certification around how their product was actually sourced, how it was produced, what type of carbon footprint is actually in whatever product it is that we happen to be using for export or for uh, intellectual property within British Columbia. Thanks, Peter. George? You're on mute, George. Sorry, my control panel disappeared on me. I think it's uh, it's important when we're thinking about diversifying the economy and fighting climate change to, uh, to see them as um, two sides of the coin. Uh, so partly when we invest from government, we want to ensure that we invest in uh, in emission reduction uh, technologies and activities that will produce the greatest number of emission uh, uh, megaton reductions per dollar invested. So our, both our recovery plan and our platform have a number of areas where we're looking. We know that we need to uh, seriously not just ensure that, um, that new buildings are constructed to be net zero or net zero ready, we have to ensure that when we invest in public sector infrastructure, we are actually looking at that standard, and we have been since we formed government. It's one of the important criteria that's re, uh, reviewed by Treasury Board. We also have to ensure that we make, whether it's electric vehicles or home retrofits or commercial building retrofits, that we make it affordable for everyone. Not everyone has the starter capital to go forward, so we're looking at uh, new programs like property assessed clean energy or uh, tailored rebates for electric vehicles that will support um, every every family, every individual at all levels to be able to afford to uh, invest in a lower carbon lifestyle. Uh, life, lifestyle. We also are supporting an, a center for innovation and clean growth. We are having an innovation challenge for the heavy duty trucking industry to develop made in BC technologies uh, that can be both used here and exported here to reduce emissions in trucking and heavy duty and commercial transportation. Thank you. All on time, so I didn't have to bring out the fly swatter. Thanks, Julia. Uh, next up, we have Anna Stukas from Carbon Engineering. Thank you, Karen, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, my question is, in the context of some of the recent announcements uh, and where there haven't been announcements from any given party, uh, I'll adapt it slightly. Uh, but in general, you know, targets are great, uh, but beyond targets, we need plans and action. So my question would be, what is your plan to close the gap between Clean BC and the 2030 targets? And beyond that, what is your plan for net zero uh, in the case of the NDP by 2050 uh, and in the case of the Greens and, and the Liberals uh, in general? What would your plan for net zero be? Thank you. So again, you'll each have 90 seconds, and the order for this will be Peter, George, and Adam. Over to you, Peter. Thank you. And, and uh, you know, our platform will be released in the next uh, few days. Unfortunately, we weren't uh, uh, releasing it uh, before this uh, debate. But, um, you know, I think you'll see a, a concerted effort on our part, and it's around that deliverable. Uh, because frankly, with Clean BC, what we have saw is emissions rise every single year uh, that the NDP have been in, in government. Um, the only environmental recognition they've gotten internationally was actually for work that was done under the previous BC Liberal government. 
Um, and so the reality is uh, actions and climate needs action. It does not need a, a fancy document that frankly uh, seemed to be designed to make sure that LNG didn't get voted uh, or they lost the confidence vote due to LNG. Um, and so, you know, Clean BC is still missing that 25%. We are committed as, as the BC Liberals, and you will see this in the platform. Again, it's awkward to not have it to talk about right now, admittedly, uh, but we are committed to make sure uh, that we are bringing forward real tangible uh, actions to make sure that innovation is there, to make sure that we're driving down emissions, to make sure that it's tangible and measurable uh, in real time so that people actually know that improvements are being made. Um, and that's really the focus that you will see uh, from us as we move forward uh, through this election campaign. Thank you, Peter. George. Thank you. So as I said earlier, we are we are looking at those measures, whether it's uh, increasing the adoption of energy efficiency in homes and buildings, increasing the uptake of um, clean uh, zero emission vehicles, investing in electrifying uh, British Columbia's uh, public transit uh, fleet, uh, not just in Metro Vancouver, but all over uh, British Columbia. These are the kinds of things that we're modeling uh, for the remaining 25%, in addition uh, to looking at uh, at supporting technological innovation that will help with that as well. As with Clean BC, we set a target and then we set about identifying those measures that could most effectively meet the target and we will do the same with net zero. So for instance, uh, we're setting up a center for innovation and clean growth to encourage new technologies that will make uh, First Columbia's industry, whether they're resource industries or, uh, or other industries more energy efficient. We are, uh, we are looking uh, to focus on the trucking and commercial transportation industries because we know there's a tremendous amount of reduction that has to happen there. But if you talk to any climate scientist or any uh, commentator, people will, will say and accept that we need new technologies that can actually uh, remove and or sequester carbon. And that's why activities like carbon engineering, uh, um, developing a direct air capture to remove carbon from the atmosphere and uh, and turn it into a, a usable product are so important and we want to support and fund those initiatives. Thanks, George. Adam. I, I, I mean, I, I don't think I can be clear enough in this answer. We need to stop adding carbon into the atmosphere. We need to stop subsidizing fossil fuels. We need to stop approving LNG. We need to stop fracking. Those are critical components to this. Uh, the, the former Minister of Environment knows full well that we can't meet those targets while we're continuing to pour carbon into the atmosphere. It doesn't make any sense to set a 2050 target with no plan if the plan is actually to continue to frack and liquefy gas and, and ship it around the world. Look, the, the, every, almost every single policy uh, that George mentions came to, the, came to these plans because the BC Greens brought them there. Clean BC was a part of the, the CASA uh, uh, agreement. Uh, the, uh, the Innovation Commissioner, the Emerging Economy Task Force, the Zero Emission Vehicle Mandate, that was because of us. The interim targets and sectoral targets, we had to fight tooth and nail for those targets. PACE, this is incredible that the NDP is running PACE out like it's something that they came up with. People have been fighting for PACE to be brought this uh, property assessed climate uh, initiative had been fighting tooth and nail to bring this forward. Municipal governments have been asking this government to do it for two years. We've been bringing it to the government for two years. Now it shows up in their platform? Come on, we gotta be honest about what we're talking about here. And, and, and this is not a good start, frankly. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Anna. Now we'll bring on Chris Heisel from Arcteryx. Thanks, Karen. Thanks for having me. Um, so my question to you today is about three things. It's about reconciliation. It's about BC's transition to 100% renewable energy. And it's about improving the energy resilience of our more remote communities, because when their power goes down, diesel generators are often the backup. So taking for granted, we need to transition BC completely to renewable energy by 2050. And taking for granted, we need to improve the energy resiliency of our more remote communities I'd like you to take into consideration the BC Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act and the recent recommendations made by the BC Utilities Commission with respect to an Indigenous utility and answer this question. 
How would your party include reconciliation into a clean energy plan detailing BC's transition to 100% renewable energy by at least 2050, while improving the energy resilience of our more remote communities? As always, bonus points to those who can answer with specifics. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. So the order for this will be George, Peter, and Adam. Over to you, George. Thank you so much, Chris. And uh, and like um, like our climate commitments and uh, our commitment to develop a climate plan and take uh, the advice from scientists and uh, and a broad range of uh, citizens and experts in British Columbia, um, our commitment to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People was part of our last platform in 2017. It didn't spring uh, solely or, uh, or even uh, in any way from our collaboration with the Greens, although we were pleased to collaborate and work with the Greens on the implementation and to adopt good ideas no matter where they came from. Uh, with respect to uh, our work with Indigenous people, we have been working with uh, Indigenous nations in a range of agreements to support um, uh, renewable electrification of remote communities, Part of a recovery plan is to electrify rural and remote uh, airports to reduce their, uh, their carbon emissions. Uh, part of our energy plan going forward will be to encourage uh, partnerships and proposals from Indigenous people to enhance British Columbia's clean energy supply in a, in a decentralized and effective way. And as well, uh, our platform contains a commitment to establish, just as we established the Secretariat, to consult effectively and build good policy and legislation with the uh, Green Caucus. It will establish a secretariat uh, to review all laws and policies of the government going forward to ensure they line up with the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People Act, which we uh, legislated last year. Thank you. Peter. Well, thank you for that question. And, and frankly, it was an astounding answer uh, by George there, because uh, as I referenced in my opening comments, Bill 17 is the exact opposite of everything you were just asking for in your question, uh, Chris. And so uh, Bill 17 that was brought forward to the legislature was going to uh, decimate uh, Indigenous nations' ability to try to have some form of economic uh, development, some form of resilience if they wanted to get onto uh, green energy with uh, IPPs. Uh, you know, the reality is they were not consulted properly. Um, so the government can say that they, they decided to pull the bill because the Green Party wasn't going to support it and the BC Liberals weren't going to support it. The reason neither of our parties were going to support that bill is because we both went out and talked to First Nations leaders and they made it all very clear that they hadn't been consulted on it. So on the one hand, the government can talk about UNDRIP all they would like, uh, actions speak louder than words. And I think Indigenous nations are sick and tired, and rightfully so, of governments coming up with uh, nice looking documents and great words with no actual action to back that up. Uh, Indigenous nations want actual action and reconciliation. We have a track record of signing over 500 agreements with First Nations in the last four years we were government. A lot of those were around energy. We would continue to work with Indigenous nations to provide them uh, the avenues they need to be self-sufficient and move forward uh, in their own right on what they see as a priority for their communities, regardless of where they are located in the province. Thanks, Peter. Adam. I need to be clear here again, like we are in this debate today because the BC NDP tore the house down around them uh, because they weren't able to get support for Bill 17 and Bill 22 as they were brought forward. As they were brought forward, was basically the first egregious act against the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act because right after we stood together unanimously to support our relatives in First Nations and communities across the province to self-determination and to economic development opportunities, the BC NDP basically threw them right under the bus. They dropped Bill 17, which was the Clean Energy Amendment Act, which basically started to uh, undo the, the uh, the, the pathway to 100% renewable energy, and and they they threw them right under the bus, and those those projects were going to be shut down because there was going to be no economic formula for them that made any sense. So the NDP this summer blames the BC Greens for not supporting that bill, but we were doing the consultation that frankly the Minister of Energy should have been doing. And I want to say this, it's not good enough program to get Indigenous communities off of diesel because we all know why they're there, because they didn't bring the power to those communities when they needed them and when they needed it. We need to start decentralizing our energies, 
supply. We need to start having people become a part of it and communities become a part of the energy supply. We need not go the direction that they wanted to go in Bill 17. And that's part of the reason why I think we're sitting here today. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Adam. All right. Our last panelist is Patrick Nangle, CEO. Patrick Nangle, CEO. Thank you, Karen. And um, thank you to all the candidates for this uh, opportunity to address uh, a question uh, to you. I, I want to speak about uh, cars. So in, in BC today, as you might well be aware, there are two cars and light duty trucks for every three people. The population of more than 5 million and, and we're a nice place to live and steadily growing. That's a large and increasing number of GHG emitting, emitting uh, vehicles. So what I would like to know is what will your government do to drive down the pollution and congestion created by all those vehicles? And if that includes a transition to uh, zero emission vehicles and other transportation modes, and we've heard references to that already a few times uh, this afternoon, how will you ensure that those are accessible options for people? Thanks, Patrick. So the order for this will be Peter, Adam, George. Uh, thank you for the question. And there's a, there's a couple factors that come into play. So the age of the fleet in British Columbia is already one of the oldest fleets of cars in Canada. And, and why that's significant is the older the car, obviously, the worse uh, footprint it has in terms of emission profile. Uh, the newer cars have a much lower emission profile than an older car. Uh, so we need to address that. The flaw in the legislation brought forward by the NDP on the, uh, the EV program by 2040 is that it does nothing around the used car market. So you can literally go and still get your, your used vehicle in British Columbia, no problem whatsoever. They can import them in from anywhere in the province or other provinces or down in the States and still sell those cars. So there's still gonna be a large portion of overall vehicle sales uh, that will still be combustion engines. So we need to make sure that we are addressing this twofold in terms of the rural uh, perspective where mass transit just simply is not an option versus uh, the urban environment and make sure that we are bringing forward a mass transit to the areas and, and encouraging development of those areas so that we can get more cars off the road in the lower mainland. Uh, we can get that EV adoption into where the large population bases are, where those short commuter halls, range anxiety is not a problem and not a worry. Um, and those, I think, when we attack both of those at the source, uh, we will see an overall fleet improvement in British Columbia, uh, less dependent on the overall numbers of vehicles per person, but more about what the overall emission profile of that overall fleet of all the vehicles is as we grow uh, with our population. Thanks, Peter. Adam. Yeah, I'd say that's a, a pretty solid answer uh, and, and certainly covers off uh, certainly a good chunk of it. And, I, and I've heard lots about the um, foreign vehicles that are coming in and they don't meet the emission standards of other jurisdictions and so we're we're happy to have them come into our province. I, I think that's a really solid aspect of this that needs to be uh, dealt with. I think that we need uh, to increase our ambition in the zero emission vehicle uh, mandate. Uh, we need to ramp that up. We need to ramp up the uh, access to charging stations. Uh, I have I have the benefit of owning um, uh, electric vehicles, and I can tell you the quality of life and the quality of transport has, has only increased. Um, I think we absolutely need to increase investments in active transportation and mass transit to get to move people away from single occupant vehicles to uh, increase the quality of their, uh, of, of their commute. Uh, and finally, I think that uh, we need to take a look seriously at what the uh, Metro Vancouver has been studying it with mobility pricing because as we move away from fossil fuels moving our uh, internal combustion engines and the money that gets paid to municipalities through the gas taxes we need to find other ways to maintain our roads and to keep them upgraded so we need to have uh, a very honest and deliberate conversation about mobility pricing and other mechanisms uh, to secure funding for our transportation network thank you thank you Thank you. Uh, I've got a, thank you. I've got an electric vehicle with uh, a lower end of the range scale because it's uh, it's older. I'm still using it, but I found in the last three years, precisely because of the investments of the BC government with some support from the federal government in networks of charging stations, it's much easier not only to move around in an urban area 
but to move around in, um, in communities on Vancouver Island and elsewhere. Uh, as for uh, ramping up our ambition on uh, zero emission vehicles, we are very close already to our 2025 target. We're within 1% of it, and we are going to ramp up our ambition by making uh, rebates and uh, accessible to more people uh, on an income-tested basis to ensure that at all levels of income, people can make the transition. But that's not enough. We uh, entered office with um, no action whatsoever on transit and uh, transit uh, in Metro Vancouver being derailed by the uh, previous Liberal government's referendum. So we committed to implement the mayor's plan. We're committed in our platform uh, to expanding the successful BC Bus North program. So not everybody has to use a vehicle. We're gonna extend uh, SkyTrain to the Fraser Valley. We're gonna double active transportation by 2030, we've already invested a lot of money in the recovery plan on active transportation, uh, and we will extend rebates to uh, use zero emission vehicles as well. We have a solid transit plan, and we plan to implement it. Thank you. So before we shift to questions from the audience, and thank you to all our panelists for their questions this afternoon, uh, we're gonna do a quick poll. So there's some audience participation that uh, can happen today. The poll question is, uh, what are the most important policies for building BC's clean economy and creating jobs? And we'll give you a minute to fill that out. <clears throat> and there's our poll results. All right, so now we'll go to questions submitted to uh, by people attending today's forum. Please feel free to send a question via the chat box uh, that's in the lower uh, portion of the control panel. Uh, we also received some questions from attendees bef uh, who uh, registered. We received many questions about the compatibility of LNG and climate action. And so the question for the panel for the candidates is the production of liquefied natural gas is associated with a substantial amount of carbon pollution. Do you think BC can develop an energy industry and achieve its legislated climate targets? The order for this will be Adam, George, and Peter. No, it can't. Uh, unless, uh, well, no, it can't. Um, it's only really uh, creative language and words that uh, where um, both I think the BC Liberals and the BC NDP as they as they teamed up and and you know I, I remember back to when we were debating uh, Bill 10 which was the uh, the um, amending act the that brought in the competitiveness package to allow uh, LNG to to industry in this province uh, and you know it was an empty room. It was an empty chamber when we were making those debates. We forced 14 votes. Every single member of the BC NDP and the BC Liberals voted 14 times to bring in LNG uh, into this problem. Uh, and they chased it hard. And the, the BC Liberals called the House back a couple of years ago, called the House back for a special debate for a special in the summer debate. to hand the LNG industry basically your cash. The BC Liberals or the BC NDP took that and they supercharged it. So no, the answer is no, you can't have your cake and eat it too. And that's the part of the dishonesty in this, in this conversation that, that I've been uh, referring to throughout uh, this debate today. You cannot have both 
And we have to make a choice and we have to make a decision. And it's pretty clear the choices that the BC Liberals and the BC NDP have made. Thank you, Adam. George. Thank you. The real issue here is the global nature of climate change and the transition from fossil fuels that has to happen worldwide. Here in BC, uh, and here I take some issue with, uh, with Adam, uh, despite our collaboration on Clean BC, all of the numbers that he's using are presuming that every uh, LNG proposal that received an environmental assessment certificate under the previous Liberal government must be counted in terms of emissions by 2050. What's going ahead today is Clean BC Phase 1. Clean BC Phase 1 was approved or uh, modeled within our Clean BC plan. We've been clear since before the last election and we're clear today. Any LNG proposal going forward has to show how it fits within the plan. And if wood fiber or anyone else comes forward, they have to show within what we know to be the amount of uh, emissions from LNG that are modeled within our Clean BC plan, how they fit in that by either reducing emissions or by the sector as a whole reducing emissions. We cannot and we will not expect every other industry in British Columbia or every other uh, family in British Columbia to make up for one small sector. That's why we're going to go ahead and set sectoral targets. Thank you. Peter. Uh, thank you. Well, just to clarify a couple things. Yes, the BC Liberals did call the House back. That was before my time or Adam's time uh, for an open and transparent vote. Um, you know, there was a, a piece of uh, legislation that was brought in. It, it took uh, uh, the former minister uh, four or five questions from me to, to admit that, in fact, it enabled the minister to set uh, by regulation without any input by the legislature targets and, and areas for LNG uh, if the House was not in session. Uh, the Greens did not uh, vote against that, uh, I would like to point out. Uh, the Greens did not vote against any of the budgets that included uh, sections in them uh, with regards to LNG, uh, the overall global provincial budget, um, that has those $6 billion of extra incentives that the NDP put in for the LNG projects. So yes, they voted against a specific bill. They didn't vote against anything else that uh, actually is interrelated with LNG. Uh, the reality is there's no way um, to not acknowledge that LNG will impact our emissions profile within British Columbia, full stop. Um, uh, we've never uh, tried saying anything any different than I'm aware of as a BC Liberal. Uh, it's how do we address it, how do we make sure that we uh, minimize uh, the impact and how do we find those savings in other sectors as well at the same time. Uh, the NDP have been very disingenuous with this and uh, and frankly the Greens could have uh, if they had not uh, taken the, the carrot of Clean BC uh, voted against the budget uh, multiple times that included clauses for Clean BC or uh, for LNG within it. Thank you. Okay so uh, one other question that was submitted uh, during the registration form was around uh, uh, ad adaptation. Several participants had questions on this theme. The question is, climate change is impacting British Columbians today. The frequency of floods, storms and wildfires is on the rise and costs Canadians billions of dollars every year. What will your party do to better protect communities from severe weather, build resilience and help British Columbians adapt to the new weather reality? And for this question, we'll go Adam, sorry, we'll go George, Adam, Peter. Thank you very much. And it's an important question. Um, about a year ago, we released um, the climate risk assessment that was the precursor uh, to the climate adaptation strategy that we will be releasing by the end of the year. Uh, it is important because we know we're already seeing impacts of climate change through uh, unpredictable and extreme weather in some cases through wildfires. Uh, people across the province have been literally choking on smoke this year. So we are um, in both our recovery and our platform. We have included a number of initiatives that begin to address this uh, directly. Uh, we, will, we have uh, spent $52 million in uh, coastal cleanup, in watershed restoration, in, uh, in habitat restoration. We have money to deal with addressing wildfire risks. We are um, taking other measures to uh, support uh, watersheds, including uh, proposing in our platform uh, a watershed uh, sustainability uh, 
a fund that we want to work on uh, with the federal government. Uh, we are proposing uh, a number of measures to uh, help uh, communities uh, invest in the kind of infrastructure they need to be resilient, uh, and that includes a uh, $100 million application fund that was part of the recovery in addition to another $300 million uh, for communities. So adaptation is very much part of Clean BC. It's important to protect communities. It also involves jobs, and in particular, during this time of COVID, when so many young people have lost their jobs, we've established thousands of jobs for young people in today undertaking some of the activities associated with adaptation. Thank you. Adam? Yeah, uh, thank you. And I think that, uh, I think it's really important to, to put some context into this. Uh, one of the um, one of the pieces of the confidence and supply agreement that was not uh, followed through on was species at risk legislation uh, it was being worked on. I know it was being worked on in the Ministry of the Environment, and all of a sudden it disappears and was going to be reformatted and reprofiled as biodiversity legislation. That also uh, didn't come in, and I it, I suspect that it didn't come in because of what something that I said in the uh, opening statement around here, which is that there's this conflict within the BC NDP to continue to frack, log, and dredge. That's a very much a perspective deep embedded deep within uh, their, their approach. And so species at risk legislation and biodiversity legislation is in direct conflict to that. We put forward a plan uh, earlier this summer that said we should, you know, first of all, stop cutting these sensitive habitats, stop logging them. Uh, they wouldn't do that. Uh, only at the very last minute, right before they call an election, do we have a a plan for BC's uh, to save BC's old growth. We offered a uh, conservation corps to get thousands. Yes, it's true, George, thousands of youth are working in there, but again, uh, out in nature, we put this forward months before, and we had much bigger numbers involved in getting people back out into nature and working. And so, the, frankly, all of our communities are very vulnerable to climate change, sea level rise. Uh, the Fraser River is, is one example of that. And there's not been near enough attention by this government or past governments in uh, in investments in, for adaptation. Thanks, Adam. Peter. Thank you. And, and I think it's important to note that not only have emissions uh, risen every year that the NDP have been in, in government, but in fact their their fiscal budget is based on emissions rising from 41 million. Uh, megatons to, to 44 because uh, they need that extra revenue and that extra revenue is going into general revenue it's not going into things like climate adaptation and so we need to make sure that things are fully funded from the taxes that they're being collected for carbon taxes are there to actually help mitigate and innovate to help us with climate change all that said uh, and and george Heyman has said this at a, at a climate event i was at that bc is i believe one tenth of one percent of global emissions so we have to recognize that we still need to work locally to try to drive down our local emissions as best as possible. But climate change and adaptation is still going to be happening uh, even if we do that. And so we need to put extra emphasis on the adaptation uh, response. If you're in the interior, things like runoff and, and, and uh, issues like that are very important uh, post fires, uh, post uh, spring freshets. We need to adapt to those. If you're down in the lower mainland, we need to make sure that the adaptation piece is there so that sea level rise is being dealt with in a proper way, in a cohesive way, and properly funded. And if we're collecting a carbon tax that's supposed to be helping to address climate change issues, it should be going to climate change issues, not to general revenue. Uh, and, and we should not be hanging our hat on bus fleets being changed out when we change out bus fleets as a matter of practice anyways as they age out. I keep getting ready to use my bell and you all will finish right on time. It's amazing. Thank you. Uh, here's a question from the audience. We're hearing lots of proposals for subsidies, both to households and business. Parties tend to call those help for families or investments in business, but they're still transfers of taxpayer dollars. And there's an expectation that regulation and taxation should have bigger impacts. So mandatory tools rather than uh, handouts. What mandatory measures would your party adopt, especially for business, to reduce emissions? The, and we'll go the order for this one, Adam, Peter, George. Um, that's a good question. I mean, I think that we have to definitely um, 
manage the fact that the decisions that we make on behalf of business do have uh, impacts on those on those businesses, and we have to be very careful uh, the the decisions that we're making and and the impacts that we're having. But I think um, um, I think we need to uh, we need to focus on the uh, focus on the heavy emitters. Again, I'm going to come back to this because I think that we can't replace a fossil fuel. Uh, we can't transition from one fossil fuel to another fossil fuel and clearly the biggest em set of emissions that we have to deal with right now are uh, with the subsidies that are going to fossil to the fossil fuel industries i think that the, the provincial government in is going in the wrong direction so let's turn the direction around on that and that'll give us the opportunity to work with the business community the small business community many of them are micro businesses in our province to ensure that the impact that they're having uh, that we're having on those businesses isn't too great and putting them under. I think it's also uh, really important uh, uh, really important to point out that um, that many of those businesses are very are struggling right now in terms of uh, in terms of their impact of COVID-19. So stop investing in and stop subsidizing fossil fuels and then we can work with the small and micro businesses uh, in our province uh, to decrease their emissions. Uh, because what we're do the path we're on is requiring those people to to reduce their emissions while letting the big industries continue to emit uh, unprohibited. Peter. Well, thank you, and and this ties into one of my earlier answers around innovation, and 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 that uh, ties in a bit to what uh, Adam was just talking about as well. Um, you know, we have to be very careful, especially now due to the pandemic. If you'd asked me this question in in February, I would have been a different answer uh, than now. We have to be recognizing that in the short term right now, um, if we brought in a very hard and fast, you must adhere to by this point uh, for business without a proper uh, support system behind it to help them drive down those emissions, um, we would put uh, even more businesses out of business, which would in turn uh, devastate our economy. So we need to make sure that the right governmental supports are in place to help incentivize, to help make sure that those targets and those adjustments to how you operate are actually achievable, are doable, and are not going to put uh, the economic well-being of the province at risk. Uh, when you look at things like heavy emitters, when you look at, say, the mining industry, or you look at haul trucks, when you look at long haul trucks and the amount of fuel that they consume and the emissions they do, that's where uh, big gains can be made. Uh, certainly, there's a ways to go yet with some of those technologies, and those are the types of technologies that we need to be supporting. And I go back to my previous answer. That's what things like carbon taxes being collected are for, not to go back into general revenue for government, but to actually help those types of innovations happen to drive down our emissions and make sure that industry and people in their own homes are actually doing their part to make that happen. Thank you. George. Well, we began uh, working on the uh, economic recovery program that CNBC and our climate commitments have to be at the center of that. We were urged to do that by Catalyst Business Coalition, by the Climate Solutions Council, by environmental groups, by uh, the Green Party, and Adam knows that. Adam may say that we were dragged kicking and screaming. The reality is that we were collaborating as we have all the way along with the Green Party. We laid out our intentions, we took their ideas, we incorporated them. When we uh, introduced a new Environmental Assessment Act, meeting our climate commitments, our legislative climate commitments, is part of that act for new environmental assessments. We have um, methane reduction targets that are by regulation for the gas industry and we intend to go further. We have building codes that new buildings have to meet and we're working with the trucking industry and we'll continue to work with the trucking industry. But it is important that we recognize that there is a built-in price signal through the carbon tax and everybody agrees, economists agree, that sending that price signal is the cheapest and most effective way to reduce emissions and we have done that. We're at the same time working and uh, uh, Peter Millibar is simply wrong on this. We return a significant portion of the carbon tax to both families, individuals, and businesses to help them uh, reduce emissions, reward them when they do, uh, help them implement new technologies, and I am looking to expand uh, that program to small and medium businesses to achieve the same results at all levels of activity. Thank you. Thank you. I think we can squeeze in one last question, and this one has to do with inclusivity. 
What would your party do to ensure that BC's rural and northern communities, not just urban centers, benefit from the transition to a clean economy? And the order for this one will be Adam, Peter, and George. Yeah, we certainly have to recognize that the needs of, uh, of rural BC and the needs of, of urban BC are not uh, are not the same. And that there's, a, a, you know, I when we were uh, driving around the province last summer, because of course we didn't do it this summer, uh, and and in those communities, uh, you don't see the same number of Teslas and, and electric vehicles driving around. You see a lot more trucks because that's what's needed. And so I think uh, we absolutely have to work with, um, in, in as, as Peter highlighted earlier, we have to work with the industries that, uh, that are the primary, primary industries uh, in, the, uh, in rural and remote British Columbia. Uh, we have to work with people to ensure that they've got options to be able to be helping and contribute to um, uh, to being uh, climate leaders like we all want us to be. Uh, I just want to I just want to make one final response here to the the comment that was made. Absolutely, clean BC is uh, the economic and environmental plan that we put forward. However, as George knows, the BC government put on the table early this year a plan from the deputy minister of, uh, of the, uh, to the premier. Don Wright, an economic plan that was in many ways stark contrast uh, to the clean BC. And so I think we have to be eyes wide open. The other thing is, is the carbon tax was the first thing that was sacrificed in COVID, even though at this point now we're talking about it being an amazing price signal in terms of how we can uh, change behavior. Thank you. Peter? Well, thank you, and, and I think it is a, it's a great question because, um, you know, I really do worry sometimes that the, the rural-urban divide um, is getting greater in British Columbia, and it really doesn't need to be. Um, we have different needs in rural BC. Um, Camelos is obviously not considered rural by most standards, but uh, my riding, if you drive five minutes uh, north of Camelos, you don't suddenly have cell service. Uh, getting high-speed internet is a challenge, um, and, and so the further afield you go, the, the worse it gets. So we've talked about diesel generation for these rural and remote communities be, um, needs to be gone. We, we need to fully support that. But if we're going to keep transitioning the economy, we need to have a very serious conversation about how we get proper broadband, how we get proper cell coverage, how we get proper technology into these smaller communities that actually want to diversify. They understand that the days of the big mill being the sole employer in town are long gone, uh, but they need that support to make sure they can actually do that, to still have a viable town where, where mills and, and other uh, extraction uh, operations are done at a very high efficiency, very clean high efficiency rate, which probably will require less manpower. Uh, but how do they keep their town solvent if they don't have the ability to let entrepreneurs flourish? So that I think would go a long way to making sure that that rural lifestyle is maintained in an environmentally carbon uh, uh, friendly way. Thanks. George? One of the key principles of our economic recovery program, as well as our platform, is to share the benefits of uh, economic stability and uh, a diversified economy with every corner of British Columbia. And that's part of our, uh, our platform and it'll be part of our budget. So with respect to connectivity, that's why we budgeted $90 million in the recovery plan to expand uh, broadband and cell coverage to all corners of the province and to work hard on it. We know that that is critical, not just to uh, allowing people to work from home or allowing businesses and, uh, and uh, tech entrepreneurs to work from every corner of the province. It's just simply important for learning. It's why we're investing in transit and clean transit in every corner of the province, whether it's Vancouver Island or BC Bus North. It's why we have ambitious climate adaptation programs, habitat restoration, watershed restoration uh, in every corner of BC that has put young people to work, uh, many young people to work, those who are most impacted by uh, COVID-19. It's why we have a communities fund for communities around the province to apply for infrastructure uh, projects and one of the screening criteria will be how does that contribute to meeting clean BC goals, both adaptation and emission reduction. We have projects and uh, proposals to invest in tech companies to support cleaner mining, both the uh, transportation that Peter mentioned, 
as well as technologies that can reduce emissions from the activity. It is core to clean BC. Thank you. All right, so we've got 30 second closing statements. I'm gonna go to Peter, Adam, and then George. Well, thank you, and, and I'll just wrap up with, again, uh, emissions have risen every year the NDP have been in office. Uh, their GHG uh, profile has gone up, which means they need it to collect more carbon tax. It's right in their budget. Um, significant portion, uh, with due respect to George, is not the same as, as all of it going back to innovation and climate change uh, uh, adaptation. And a lot of those programs were existing under BC Liberal uh, policies. They've been, simply been a continuation and a continuation of for clean BC are the same as what you burn under the same as well as the end point. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Adam. Peter. Adam. I'm from the Satanist territory. The teachings of my South Wayne, my ancestors, provide a way forward for us as we seek to engage our natural surroundings, embracing the finiteness of the world we live in with honesty. We can achieve the balance we need. We must approach this work in a good way, powered by the force that sustains each and every one of us fauna and flora alike. More than planks in a platform built on deception, we need action. Whatever happens on October 24th, I can tell you with certainty that BC Greens need to have a strong voice to inform the public policy and hold the government, whoever they are, accountable to their promises and actions. Thanks. Thanks. George. Thank you very much. Uh, we have the most ambitious climate plan in North America. Andrew Weaver has recently uh, stated and reaffirmed that. To support that plan, Clean BC, we have budgeted more than $1.3 billion over four years, and we're committed to putting it at the heart of future budgets. That is more than the carbon tax. We have a government that is brought in because we committed in, uh, in 2017 to fight climate change. We have a program. We've collaborated with the Greens on that we will continue to collaborate with British Columbians to make the difference we need in the climate change fight. Thank you. Thank you to all of you for spending an hour today with us and to all of our audience as well for joining us on this uh, to discuss climate and the economy. We weren't able to get to nearly uh, all the questions that folks submitted today. However, next Thursday, October 15th, there is another debate that's hosted by some of BC's best known environmental groups that will dive into more of these environmental and climate issues. You can find the link to register for that event in the chat box. We'll be posting the video recording of today's forum online. You'll receive a link in your email. Please share it with your networks and please enjoy the rest of your afternoon.